Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is my first time at Berlin Buzzwords. I've really enjoyed uh, meeting everyone so far, and I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to give this presentation today. So as mentioned, the title of the presentation is Under the Hood with Vec of Vector Search with JVector. Uh, I'm Joel Knight, and I work uh, at Datastax as a software engineer, mostly on problems in the domain of vector search. Um, I'm also a committer on Apache Cassandra and a major contributor to JVector, a new uh, library we're developing for ANN vector search uh, in Java. So just kind of a quick overview of what I plan to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the motivation of vector search, why it might be an interesting problem to solve, um, some applications in industry and research, a little bit about the history of the field. Uh, that will frame our discussion as to what we're building and why. And in the process of doing that, we'll go over some of the relevant research, present high-level, non-exhaustive summaries of the research with kind of enough threads to pull on that if you're interested, you can go look into it more. We'll talk about how some of that research is reflected in the choices we made in building JVector, how we evaluated that research, and similar ideas as inspired. Uh, and then we'll talk about some related topics to that research and potential avenues for further development, both for uh, research, but also industry. Um, those ta takeaways will kind of wrap us up, and I'll try to leave a few minutes for questions at the end. So um, to frame vector search, we really want to talk about similarity search a little more broadly. Similarity search as a field is one that's a little bit difficult to characterize because at least on its face, it's an extremely broad topic, right? Um, when we talk about answering the question of which entities resemble a query, uh, that's a problem we see virtually everywhere. There are applications in kind of some of the more obvious spaces, uh, computer vision, document retrieval recommender systems, but also interesting applications across you know, biology, genomics, uh, gene sequences. Uh, and so we can bring those same techniques to bear across uh, a wide variety of applications. Uh, when we do similarity search, really all we need to bring to the table is some function to quantify similarity. Um, that's going to be our only comparator in the domain of these objects. Uh, when we look at ways we might be able to perform some similarity search over different diverse set of objects, a really common technique we'll see now is the usage of embeddings. So embeddings are going to be the output of a model that essentially take your input object and transform it into a, a vector, a, a common vector. And, and what's interesting about the usage of embeddings in this space is it lets us transform essentially a semantic problem to a geometric problem. So we can introduce all of the techniques we have um, you know, at hand developed through geometry, mathematics, uh, and, and use it to answer semantic questions about the similarity of objects. Um, you know, as mentioned, What's interesting about this is it captures some of the underlying understanding of these objects and things like the difference between man bites dog and dog bites man. So if we have embeddings and we can transform our problem of similarity search to this more tractable geometric problem of vector search, we want to talk a little bit about how we might do that at a very high level. So vectors, you know, you'll have a direction, you'll have a length, we'll represent them by numbers in some basis. Uh, in a very literal sense, you know, you're looking at float 32 arrays most of the time. Uh, if we have this embedding model, we can embed all of the objects in our domain that we want to query against. Uh, we can embed our query using that same embeddings model and then use our natural similarity function of that embedding model to search over it. Typically, that similarity function is going to be dot product, inner product, Euclidean distance, cosine, just sort of whatever is prescribed by the, the structure of the model. Um, when we're searching over those objects, there's really two different ways we can ask the question of similarity. There's what might be called KNN, or exact K nearest neighbor vector search, or ANN, in which we introduce an element of approximation. Uh, the natural inclination might be that KNN is really what we want. If we think we can answer the question exactly, you know, why not go down that avenue? The answer really comes down to the curse of dimensionality, which is a term you'll see used across mathematics um, to kind of throw up our hands and say we don't know how to solve a problem. Uh, in the case of exact K nearest neighbor vector search, that means that we have some sort of spatial data structures that work well for organizing this problem in two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions. But as soon as we grow beyond that, the sort of rapid growth in the volume span means those data structures just kind of collapse. They stop becoming useful to us, and we degrade to linear search. So there are times we know we need exact k nearest neighbor. And in that case, we can kind of do the slow right thing. But the rest of the time, it turns out a much more interesting question to answer is sort of that approximate question of what we think are some good, best, nearest neighbors. And if we can get that answer in something like a logarithmic time or a polylogarithmic time, that might be a lot more compelling for us than an exact search over the KNN neighbors. 
Um, so as mentioned, A and N, you know, you're going to sacrifice those exact answers for some efficiency at uh, insert query time. Um, it's rich with trade-offs for sort of the obvious reasons. We can, we can accept worst answers and find them faster. We can make different compromises for latency on insert, on search. We can have throughput considerations, you know, resource utilization, whatever that means in whatever configuration of the system. Uh, when we're evaluating ANN search systems, usually the metric of quality we'll see is sort of M recall at N. And what we mean by that is if we retrieve uh, N vectors using our ANN search, what proportion of the true M nearest neighbors are going to be contained in that search? Um, depending on the configuration of your system, there's a lot of different values of M and N that are interesting. Uh, when we're performing ANN search, we're going to build an index over the vectors uh, in our, you know, domain of objects we're querying over. And there's really two main approaches we see to building that index: uh, a kind of partitioned IVF approach and a graph approach. Partitioned is sort of what it sounds like. We're going to have some way to determine bucketing within the space spanned by our vectors. We're going to associate a vector with one or more buckets. At query time, we're going to find what we believe to be relevant buckets, go to those buckets, evaluate a posting list, and search it exhaustively. The traditional pros and cons of that approach are kind of exactly what it sounds like. We'll have a relatively low additional memory footprint to the index. We really only need to track those clusters. Uh, it's kind of sympathetic to the hardware in that we can organize those posting lists in whatever way we think might be interesting for the evaluation of similarity. Uh, it's a good fit for static indexes where we can develop that partitioning, that bucketing, achieve the properties we want, leave that index sort of fixed and search over it many times. Uh, the cons, you know, anytime we have a bucketing of space, there's problems with boundary nodes near the partitions between different buckets. There's problems of assignment at search time. There's questions of how many buckets to evaluate. And all of that hyperparameter tuning in practice is, is challenging. Uh, graph, on the other hand, is perhaps, you know, in, in some ways conceptually simpler to implement. It's, it's easier to have a live index that we're building uh, online with competitive search performance, high recall, but the drawbacks are essentially your, your memory footprint. That's what you're always fighting with a graph index. You have far higher overhead. Um, you know, we have a, a node per vector, but then we also have edges approximating, approximating some proximity graph in the associated overhead. So given that positioning, I, I want to talk at a very high level about what JVector is, explaining those terms, and why we built it. So it's an embedded library providing graph-based ANN indexes for vector search. By embedded, we mean it, it's providing that most primitive indexing layer, but it's not a full database. Um, it's only implementing graph-based indexes. We have no partitioning support in this. It's, it's not a backend that is sort of comprehensive. Uh, the indexes are incrementally updatable and immediately searchable. By that, we mean they're online. We can search them, insert concurrently, results are immediately available. There's no batched insert where we have to do some other processing to make those results available. Uh, we aim for high recall. We want good relevancy. We want low latency on searches and inserts. Those are both, both important to us. We don't have a batch insert process. And we want you know good resource utilization, whatever that means. We want it to make economic sense. Uh, the indexes are suitable for usage in memory and on disk. By that, we mean we can build an index in memory, we can search against it in memory, we can flush it to disk, make it immutable, and search against it on disk. Uh, we want it to be efficient on disk, even for cases where the index or the set of indexes that we're searching against are larger than memory. Um, it, it's low dependency Java with multiple backends so that we can use the hardware the best we can, and it's Apache license, uh, v2.0 open source if you want to go look at it. Um, so, as a jumping off point for kind of modern graph based ANN indexes, I want to talk a little bit about HNSW or hierarchical navigable small worlds. Uh, this is an iteration on earlier ideas around navigable small worlds. Uh, as a quick definition of both of those properties, navigability means that we have proximity graph with some poly logarithmic scaling in the number of hops to get from one node to the other. It just means we can navigate across this, gra this graph quickly, which we, we want to be able to do. And small world means we have high clustering within the graph with low distances between any two nodes. 
That's a notion that's had a lot of research around it, developed around originally social networks in the real world, but broadly across kind of graph theory. So if we have this proximity graph, we need a way to search it. Uh, in HNSW, that's a greedy best first search procedure. Uh, that's where we want navigability. Uh, in short, what that means is we'll have an entry point into the graph. We'll maintain a priority queue of candidates, a priority queue of results. Uh, we'll look at that entry point, evaluate its neighbors. Our candidates will always be sorted by the next best candidate. Our results will always be easy to replace the worst. We'll navigate through that graph, find some local minimum, accumulate the number of results requested, and then kind of terminate that search as the uh, end of that search condition. That's the search procedure you see with small variation uh, across virtually all graph-based indexes for A and N. One thing that's appealing about this uh, and kind of graph-based A and N indexes in general is that there's a really neat similarity between uh, search and insert. The insert process for a graph-based A and N index is broadly driven by searching and evaluating either the nodes along the search path or in the result set for uh, potential edge candidates. So when inserting a new node, we'll search across the graph, find appropriate nodes to link it to, and create those links. Uh, HNSW really kind of has two key principles that distinguish it as a graph-based A and N index. Uh, first, it's hierarchical. Um, what that means in this case is that we have multiple layers of the graph that function much like a skip list. So our base layer will contain all nodes in the index, all vectors we're indexing over, and we'll have some probability function with decreasing probability for a node to be uh, included at each layer above that. What that means is that we have this natural provision to build small length links and long length links to achieve those navigability and small world properties we want. Um, so at the higher levels of the graph, where vectors we're indexing are sparser in the space, we naturally create these long-range edges that let us navigate quickly to sort of the region of the graph we want to be in. We'll move down through the layers at search time. And on that base layer, we have an abundance of those short links that let us thoroughly explore that region of the graph. Uh, the next important part of HNSW is a notion of diversity that you'll see in graph-based ANN indexes. What that means, uh, kind of put casually, is that if a node already has plenty of good edges to move in a given direction, it will prefer adding an edge sort of in another way, even if that might be a slightly worse candidate other, under other evaluations of edge quality. Um, so that's kind of the, the core tenets of HNSW, and it's extremely competitive in memory. Uh, it, it's robust. It works well for a variety of data sets and embedding models. Uh, high recall, decent latency. Uh, but there's sort of a challenge as soon as you want to get bigger than memory, which we see increasingly as, as kind of we have these growth of larger vectorized data sets. Um, so, don't read too much into this graph, but naively, it's a flame graph. Uh, early in the life of JVector, we were looking at sort of HNSW implementations, decided to do the most naive thing of, of putting it on disk and memory mapping it and seeing how it affected performance. And typically, when we're flame graphing these workloads, we see some time in kind of data structure maintenance around the search, a lot of time in similarity computation, and some time kind of going from disk to memory. Uh, once we put HNSW on disk, we, we really just spend our entire time in the I.O. hierarchy. So that leads us to the consideration that perhaps putting HNSW on disk is going to be a challenge. The good news is that we are uh, not alone in that concern. So to kind of bring you up to the current state of the art on both partitioned and graph-based indexes uh, for kind of general purpose CPU ANN indexing. Um, there, there's a couple things to highlight in each category. So in the partitioned IVF space, we've got scan with SOAR and SPAN. Uh, both of those kind of have interesting things to say about all the hard problems in partitioned IVF indexes. Uh, SPAN introduces a, a notion of hierarchical clustering to kind of balance that posting list length. That's what we want to see. We don't want posting list length to vary dramatically. Uh, it has sort of query-aware pruning. It's better than most partition indexes at knowing when to stop looking for better results. And it also is somewhat strategic about when it might adjust boundary points along partitions and what useful partitions uh, might be available for redundancy. Uh, SCAN and SOAR has developed those ideas 
kind of in a different direction and very strategically. Uh, the most interesting thing about Scan and Soar to me is that it really acknowledges that the maximum inner product search space, uh, like the use of that distance metric means that the other spatially aware parts of our clustering can be refined. Uh, Scan and Soar adapts that by very strategic use of replication uh, such that we kind of optimize for the ortho orthogonality whenever we use multiple buckets. And what that means is that for those boundary cases where we might miss a bucket, we pick uh, redundant buckets that have kind of a maximal chance of, of covering our back in that case. Uh, in, in the graph space, we have disk ANN, which we can think of as a refinement of a graph-based ANN index uh, specifically to span memory and disk. And we also have NGT, which has evolved from uh, navigating graphs and trees has evolved over time to, to encompass a lot of interesting ways to apply quantization to graph-based ANN indexes. For all of these, um, they're all kind of targeting billion scale. So that modern notion of what a large vectorized data set is. So disk ANN, uh, in short, their goal is to construct graph indexes suitable for memory and disk. Their desired properties overlap with ours in JVector. They want high recall. They want low latency. They want high density. Uh, they want high density in insert, search. Um, so it, it, it's not just good enough to be able to build these somewhere else and move it onto a machine. They want to be able to build it on the same machines. Uh, how does it achieve those? There's kind of four interesting parts of the design to talk about. Vimana, the disk format of disk ANN, product quantization, and a notion of re-ranking. So Vimana is a novel graph index construction algorithm introduced in disk ANN papers. Um, they abandon the hierarchical structure of HNSW. Uh, in theory, that, that's you know, a desirable property. There's some complexity of that skipless structure of multiple graphs. Uh, but you do lose that natural tendency to produce long range edges. So they have to find another way to introduce those long range edges that allow efficient navigation while also retaining this single level directed graph structure. The way they do that is through a, a construction procedure comparable to HNSW with sort of a tunable alpha, alpha parameter that relaxes those diversity constraints. And what that means is if we have the opportunity to add a long range edge or long range edge that moves sufficiently past our existing edges, we can apply that scaling fact factor, add it to the graph, and retain that navigability. Uh, what's nice about Vimana is that you might think those compromises to make it work on disk significantly affect its performance in memory, but in practice it performs very similarly to HNSW in memory. So we can kind of only adopt one index construction procedure and use it across memory and disk. The next part of the disk ANN design, excuse me, that is um, you know, worth consideration is the disk format. Uh, disk ANN produces maximum degree graphs, which means that we can kind of serialize this all to disk predictably for random access. Uh, it inlines full resolution vectors uh, with the graph structure on disk. That means we can piggyback those reads along with the navigation of the graph and reduce our total number of random access reads to the SSD. Uh, it uses beam search. Uh, this is a slight tweak to the search procedure to re retrieve the candidate neighborhoods of candidate nodes in sort of larger batches to allow just better usage of IOQs, um, kind of reach closer to saturation threshold without, without backing those up. Uh, and they have a provision for building larger than memory graphs by building multiple graphs and stitching them together. So. Let's say we have some 10 million node data set. We can only afford to build 4 million nodes at a time. They'll introduce multiple clusters of that data set, assign a node to multiple clusters, build all of those completely separately, and take union of edge ranges, um, and, and then prune those to keep our maximum degree property. It's actually pretty compelling that this works. Um, it, it's not a given that this would retain a graph structure that has the properties we want. Uh, there is some complexity to it. Uh, there's some overhead to it. We are building all of these graphs independently. So at this point, we have a graph construction algorithm that works on disk. We have a format on disk that's amenable to kind of the IO properties we want. Uh, we haven't really solved the search problem. If we're still reading these full resolution vectors into memory, we're going to dramatically degrade search performance. 
the way disk a and addresses that is through product quantization, uh, a technique typically associated with partitioned and IVF indexes with lower recall. Product quantization you can think of as a lossy compression scheme for vectors. Um, product in this case refers to kind of the Cartesian product. Uh, any, anytime we're doing quantization, there's this tension of, you know, we want to retain a high level of accuracy, but we don't want an explosion in, in the space we're spanning with our quantization, or it's just not particularly effective. The way the product quantization addresses that is through um, separately quantizing um, subspaces of the total space spanned by our vectors. So in this case, we can see we have you know, a 128 dimension vector of float 32s. We'll split that into a bunch of 16 dimension sub vectors. Uh, we'll do that over our whole data set. Um, so now we have these subspaces with many points in them. We'll run k-means clustering over them individually and produce a bunch of quantization code books. So, it's really kind of simple clustering-based quantization applied to many subspaces and then taking the Cartesian product for encoding. So, you know, we can see an example. We have some input vector. We've produced those centroids. We know how to encode vectors in those subspaces. And for a given vector in the data set, we can condense it pretty compactly down to, you know, in this case, we split 128 into 16, and we'll go from four bytes for our float 32 into a single byte to identify our 256 centroids. We can achieve 32x or 64x compression that works. Um, there really aren't too many compromises with this compression. It's robust, it's applicable to a variety of data sets, it's fast, it's pretty small. Um, you can get a lot more clever with this. In the most simple way, you know, we chunked this uniformly across our uh, adjacent components of the vector. Uh, in many cases, in some cases by design, our embeddings those dimensions aren't of equal relevance and value. Um, so we can apply techniques of like PCA, introduce orthogonal matrices, rotate those uh, products before quantization or those vectors before product quantization and achieve slightly more effectiveness for the same footprint. Uh, in practice, that additional value for us has rarely been worth it, so we don't do it. So we've achieved a smaller footprint for vectors, which is great. It's friendlier to memory accesses. Uh, all of those other qualities we want. It's more condensed in memory, um, but we still need to do fast similarities using it. Uh, kind of the naive thing you would do with product quantized vectors is, okay, we have all of those indexes. We know the centroids we refer to. We can rematerialize these quantized vectors in memory and, and do similarity again in this full vector space we originally had. Uh, that's not very fast. Um, so we want to think about ways we can reduce the amount of computation there. Uh, the first approach you might consider is something called symmetric distance computation, where we're going to build a lookup table between each possible encoding of a vector. We'll encode the query vector uh, and, and then use that lookup table. What's appealing about this lookup table is it only needs to be built at the time of product quantization. Since we're also quantizing the query vector, we have that symmetry and there's nothing that needs to be done at query time. Uh, in practice, this has an unacceptable effect on recall. The next extension of that is uh, asymmetric distance computation. In the same way, we'll build lookup tables over these centroids, uh, but we'll build them at query time per query vector. This achieves a high, much higher level of relevancy and recall um, at the cost of doing more work per query time. Uh, when disk a and is using product quantization, it's always going to keep these codebooks and quant quantized vectors in memory. So there still is some memory overhead proportional to our number of vectors, but it's at least dramatically reduced compared to something like HNSW that keeps the full footprint vectors in memory. Um, so just kind of a quick worked uh, example of what I talked about with ADC. Uh, we have all of these subspaces. We have these centroids we've generated. Um, we have our encoded vectors. At the beginning of a query, we'll split that into sub vectors along the same lines as the product quantization. Uh, for each of these centroids, we'll take the query subvector, calculate some fragment of our distance calculation, store it in this lookup table. It's visualized in two dimensions, but really this will be contiguous in memory. Uh, so it has all of those advantageous properties we want. It's amenable to like read ahead and prefetching and, and all of those properties that are sympathetic to the hardware. Um, and then at query time, as we evaluate all of these uh, quantized query vectors for similarity, uh, we're not actually doing calculation of any distance, we're just doing lookup and accumulation. Uh, 
Uh, this is very SIMD friendly. We can take these encoded vectors and kind of map them into memory offsets, some of these uh, vertically throughout the uh, many dimensions of the, of the query vector and then end with one horizontal reduction. So we've prescribed a way to more efficiently do queries using ADC with PQ. Um, what if we just did that? That's our only similarity metric. We have these indexes. Let's search across it. Uh, as soon as we start achieving any meaningful reduction in footprint, uh, recall falls off dramatically. Um, you know, e each of these clusters is a different data set. Uh, the bars left to right are kind of none, 4x, 8x, 13x, or 16x, 32x, 64x compression. Uh, and, and the shape of these across models, across data sets is very clear once we get past the kind of 8x compression level, we start seeing a huge decrease in results quality. So just using PQ alone with a graph-based uh, ANN index isn't really what you want. The way disk ANN solves that is re-ranking, which has also been used in a couple other graph-based ANN indexes. So we'll perform the bulk of our search with those product quantized vectors. During the course of that search, we'll ask for slightly more vectors than we think we need. And at the termination of that search, we'll take those full resolution vectors that piggybacked with our navigation of the index and use those to compute the full resolution distance similarity over a much smaller set of vectors uh, than we encountered during our search. Um, this is an extremely robust technique. It's extremely durable. Um, it, it kind of fixes all of our problems. So this is JVector. Uh, zooming in on one of our data sets, compression levels in each clustering, and then within each uh, cluster, we kind of have our baseline. You know, we ask for k answers, we ask for 2k answers, we ask for 3k answers. In practice, we see that even with 64x compression, as soon as we ask for three times as many answers and re-rank those, uh, we see faster overall queries with higher overall relevance. So re-ranking is, is, at least in my opinion, kind of the the magic footnote of the paper, uh, it, it's what makes all of this work. So what of those approaches translated to JVector? Uh, we have basically Vimana-esque indices. They're single level directed proximity graphs. We can build those with non-blocking concurrency between both searches and inserts and scale linearly with inserts on the number of cores. Um, we build indexes in memory like disk ANN. Uh, we flush them to disk. We have a similar disk layout optimized for random access. We use the same course search with re-ranking and termination. Uh, we, we didn't adopt something that resembles their approach to larger than memory construction. Uh, when evaluating product quantization, a natural next step is can we do better? Uh, we tried binary quantization. Um, this reduces each component of the vector to a single bit. Um, in the common case where it's like a cosine distribution, kind of a sphere around zero, um, you just use the sine. Um, in this case, your distance is reduced to a Hamming distance. We can do like a vectorized pop count that's pretty fast. Um, we implemented it. Uh, we found that even the most basic product quantization is really hard to beat. Uh, you can compare this BQ over query re-ranking graph to our earlier PQ graph. Um, you know, with PQ, we see ourselves recovering everything we want with overquery. With BQ, that's often not the case for many models. So sort of an unacceptable compromise on, on relevance and recall for us. The next uh, fascinating kind of extension on PQ I want to talk about is called polysimus codes. So recall that for each of our subspaces, we have this product quantization code book that only contains uh, centroids. And we don't really care what the indices of those centroids are, as long as we agree on them at build and code time. We don't care if a centroid is the seventh centroid or the 128th centroid. Um, Polysimus Codes takes advantage of that and says, hey, you're already reading these encoded uh, indices from memory. Uh, what if we can take advantage of the fact that those indices are arbitrary and kind of pack more information in there? The way it does that is by running simulated annealing on those codebook indices such that we can coarsely use the Hamming distance between those to approximate whatever our similarity function is. Uh, this is a really neat idea. It's kind of free. Uh, you, you can take these indices when you read the encoded vector, calculate this very approximate distance, and use it as sort of a first pass rejection. 
Uh, it was developed in the context of partitioned and IVF indexes where you might evaluate a large number of vectors that have low similarity quality. Uh, we attempted something similar with a graph-based ANN index to use it as a first-pass rejection and found it was extremely hard to incorporate into the right part of the graph search procedure. Um, if you do it too infrequently, you don't really reject enough vectors to recover the additional overhead of doing those Hamming distances. And if you do it too often, you really compromise your navigation quality on the graph. Uh, Next approach um, to query acceleration that's a little distinct from some of the compression-based approaches uh, is called FINGER, or Fast Inference for Graph-Based Approximate Nearest Neighbor Search. Uh, the authors behind this paper kind of took a look at the landscape, said it seems like people are spending a lot of time optimizing for graph construction. They're spending a lot of time optimizing for quantization. Is there some way we can accelerate search that's universally applicable to anything doing this greedy, best-first uh, graph search? Uh, what they did is really clever. So they decomposed distance and inner product based similarity metrics algebraically so that they break down into some components that are built at index time, some components that are built at query time, some components that are part of a candidate neighbor or a candidate node in the graph, and some components that are per neighbor. And by doing so, they allow like reuse of calculations. Um, the primary way they do this is by only approximating one part of this and retaining the rest of this either at build time or over the course of the navigation, and ultimately only need to approximate the angle between a node and its neighboring nodes in the graph. Um, they do that kind of the typical way you would do those things. They take a single singular value decomposition, build a low rank approximation, eventually pack that down to a single bit, and again, we get a vectorized uh, pop count. So everyone loves to look for the Hamming distance uh, in kind of any shape of this problem. It, it, it's fast, that is true. Uh, Finger was developed in the context of HNSW style graphs where all of your similarity searches are for full resolution vectors. So that was their target point to beat on speed. Uh, when we tried something similar in JVector, we found, again, it's tough to incorporate into the search procedure. We already had an extremely fast, fairly high quality approximation in our ADC PQ. Uh, so introducing a third pass where sometimes we use finger, if that's good enough, we use PQ, if that's good enough, we re-rank with full resolution. Again, it was very challenging to find that trade-off point where the amount of work we're saving in some cases justifies that additional first pass. So two ideas, Polysimus codes and finger, both extremely interesting, uh, both didn't quite pan out for us. Um, next idea, anisotropic PQ. Uh, again, a clever, uh, clever observation of the problem we're actually solving here. Product quantization in its clustering is naively using L2 distance, um, but not all L2 distances are equal when you're performing inner product based search. You have different contributions to similarity scores from components parallel to your query vec vector than orthogonal residuals. And so they introduced tweaked loss functions where we're optimizing for the quality of our approximation for close vectors. Um, you know, we, we care a lot about a similarity score that's 0.9 or 0.89. We care far less about a similarity score that's 0.2 or 0.19. So by losing approximation quality for those nodes far away from a query vector, you gain approxim approximation quality for nodes close to a query vector, which is far more relevant for a graph-based ANN index. On paper, really interesting. In practice, um, this was the hardest set of hyperparameters we ran into. It's extremely hard to tune those loss functions in a way that's generalizable across models. So we do still have a form of this in the code base, but we don't sort of use it on the default path. Uh, quicker ADC. Let's go back to the ADC concept we had earlier. Quicker ADC is a part of a family of papers, fast scan, quick ADC, quicker ADC, that aim to accelerate our ADC process. Anytime you're doing product quantization-based similarity, your bottleneck is memory access, ultimately. The goal of this family of papers is take those lookup tables that were previously putting in blocks of memory and fit them into a register. Along the way, you have to make a lot of compromises on space. Um, the way they do that is through a quantization scheme that's built over the lifetime of a query, requantizing in memory, and then doing vertical accumulation across the register. 
Uh, what's hard about that is regular PQ, you're doing a vector at a time. To be able to efficiently use a, a lookup table you put into a register, you need to do multiple vectors at a time, which means all of a sudden you need your vectors to be transposed in a way that you can quickly uh, get them into and out of those lookup functions. So that works well for partitioned approaches where we don't really care about the shape of the vectors on disk, but it's less amenable to graph-based approaches where typically we look up neighbors and then look up associated vectors rather than uh, storing those quantized vectors in the graph. Um, so the downside of this approach in a graph, you're paying some redundancy, you're storing encoded vectors multiple times because they need to be stored with each edge. Um, are the costs really too high? Uh, we looked at that choice and decided maybe not. Um, so we introduced a scheme where we do accept that redundancy, store those quantized transposed vectors with the graph and, and use that to accelerate our search. Uh, the wins aren't as big for quicker ADC in a graph-based context, but you recover some of that cost and you get to keep them on disk instead of in memory. Uh, how do we do larger than memory in JVector? In short, um, when disk A and N builds an index, it uses full resolution similarity. When we do it, uh, we use product quantized similarity. We've found that by introducing over query, we recover that graph quality. Graphs are still searchable. They don't have a huge effect on recall. Um, why do we want to do that? Uh, if you have multiple graphs, you introduce additional latency by searching across all of them. So the bigger graph you can build, um, the less impact you have on latency. Uh, filtering, um, you can imagine hybrid queries where we want to also filter these vectors based on other properties. Uh, you, you kind of need at least two forms of that, a pre-filtering for a case where you expect a low amount of matches and you can push that down into the graph and only return, the, return those nodes, and post-filtering uh, when you expect a lot of matches. Uh, the hard part of post-filtering is you know, you'll over-query so that you think even after rejecting you can meet your top K, but if you're wrong you have to go back and do it all again. Uh, the way we work around that in JVector is by actually retaining the portion of the graph that we navigated to and the candidates we rejected. Uh, putting those back in and being able to resume a search. So that work of getting back to the same region of the graph to return more than K results, we can reduce dramatically. Uh, so kind of milestones we covered, fast scan, quick ADC, quicker ADC family, disk A and N, scan, span, uh, the larger than memory graph uh, construction approach we introduced. Uh, as you can see, these are kind of innovations, a lot of different parts of the space. Uh, so now, how would we describe JVector? It's an embedded library providing ANN indexes in memory on disk with composable extensions, lock-free Vimana, product quantization, binary quantization. We use re-rank pervasively, uh, and the way we do that is through using Panama Vector and FFM APIs. Uh, takeaways, um, there's active innovation in a lot of different domains in the field. Uh, virtually everybody's looking for hybrid solutions in a lot of ways. Hybrid queries, hybrid disk memory, hybridization of techniques across the partitioning and graph space. I didn't mention this earlier, but SPAN uses a graph to organize its centroids for those different IVF buckets. Um, you, you really need to test all of this stuff. Virtually everything in the field is heuristic, uh, empirical. It's really hard to, to understand the structure of these graphs. So if you can reproduce those results and share those results, it puts all of us in a better place. Um, here are all the references for all the papers I mentioned. They all have a lot more interesting content than I was able to touch on today. Uh, I think that's it. I have a minute for a question, but you can find me afterward if you want. And uh, thanks everyone for sticking it out. I know that was fast. That was the goal. Thank you, Joe. It's a very interesting presentation. Uh, I think we have one minute for a question. I was curious with graph-based approaches, how often you have to completely rebuild the graph if things get completely unbalanced? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. Um, I'll find you after if you want to dig into it more. Um, we have heuristics we use to kind of repair a graph in the, in the case of deletes to improve the quality of entry points, that sort of thing. In practice, we find those are enough, um, but you know, that's not a rigorous approach. So it, it, it's a good question. That is a challenge for graph-based ANN indexes, for sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, of course, feel free to pick Joe's mind um, after the talk, which is yet over. Uh, yeah, see you around. Thanks. Thank you.